Today's episode, we're going through our top 10 running backs, find out who made the cut, find out who's just on the outside. Don't miss a moment. There's some indecisiveness in the air, but I promise you, I don't take this lightly. My fantasy draft, it's an important job. I need someone I can trust, and the fantasy footballers are my number one guys. Their ultimate draft kit is the everything I need to get ready for my drafts. Don't dance with the devil in a pale moonlight. Jump on over to www.ultimatedraftkit.com. Without it, you just might be a dead man. <laughs> hey, this is Austin Eckler, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome. To the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. <laughs> it's Friday time. <laughs> you, you stated that as the fact that it is. Well, like. For us, you know, and I can, that's the only experience I can speak from, but we've had such a strange work schedule. We've been at home for so long. Time uh, flattened and ate itself like a <laughs> like the snake mm-hmm. that yes. just bites its tail and then yeah. s- and consumes itself alive. Time does not exist, yeah. School has started for the children's, mm-hmm. much to their chagrin. Mm-hmm. They're, they're doing the virtual thing, but it's like I woke up and went, Holy crap! It's it's. I know it's Friday. Yeah. Right. I I don't have to wake up at six thirty in the morning tomorrow. I could sleep in at least a little a, bit. A Friday means something. Now. Yes. Like that, fr- that's all it meant. Is yeah. Like, hey. And Friday. I believe I could be wrong here. Someone do the math. <laughs> I think this is our first Friday show of the year. That seems like the math checks out. Incredible. Is the computer good? <laughs> Yeah, what do you do? The dot matrix printer? (laughs) Yes, the math checks out. Welcome into the show, the fantasy footballers, Andy, Mike, and Jason back with you. Top 10 running backs. It's time. Will Austin Eckler, leading us into the show, be in the list? Wait and find out. I know what Mike would do in a situation (laughs) like this. We have our first best ball breakdown segment on the show today. This is best ball season, so if you are playing at Underdog Fantasy, you are looking for some strategic advice. This is when you do your best ball drafts, and we're going to break it down for you at the uh, back half of the show. Get into some mailbag if we have time for it. And uh, it is Friday. Foot Clan Friday. As is the tradition here at the Fantasy Footballers, we use Fridays to celebrate the Foot Clan, the supporters of the show over at jointhefoot.com. And this year is going to be a little yeah. bit different. Better. <laughs> it, I mean, we're both true. It's different, but it's better. We're both true. We're both true, as he said. This we uh, this what we're doing is we used to give a, a gift card to Shop Ballers. Uh, we're going to give an exclusive uh, an exclusive item away from Pristine Auction, and today's item is a Sammy Watkins signed oh, man. jersey. It's cold blooded. Sammy Watkins signed jersey goes to Ashley Kent. Mm. Congratulations! Thank you for supporting the show, Ashley. An exclusive item every Friday to the Foot Clan. Thanks for supporting the show and enjoy your Sammy Watkins jersey from pristineauction.com where you can sign up and use the code BALLERS and get $10 off your first sports memorabilia purchase. So the first Foot Clan Friday in the books for 2020. Uh, A reminder, you can get the Ultimate Draft Kit at ultimatedraftkit.com. Get ready for your drafts. Makes sense. Yeah, look, when you're getting ready for drafts, you need something that's ultimate. Yes, yes. I took a little poll on Twitter. Um... 
to see how many people are playing in more leagues or about the same amount of leagues. And most of you are doing what you've done over it's, the past few years. It feels like a status quo year. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not adding to the yes. equation as much, but there were there were still about twenty percent of oh, people there's maniacs out that, there. that yeah. want more. Yeah. M O A R. More. <laughs> Uh, quick question of the day from Alex in uh, British Columbia. Oh, bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> Hi, ballers. I love co-managing a team with a good friend as it gives us lots of reasons to stay in touch. But last year, we had a lot of disagreements over starts and sits. And do you have any recommendations for successfully co-managing? Mm. And they throw in a merci. Oh, yeah. There you go. Knowing, knowing that the bonjour was on the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, co-managing is, I, I have a confession to me. Okay. I'm a terrible <laughs> co-manager. In fact, I'm I, just the worst. I need to stay nimble. I need to stay fresh. I need to be able to do what I need to do. And I have a co-owner and his name is Brian in our league of record. And maybe co-owner is generous in that situation. You let him know what you've done. Yeah. Yeah. By him receiving the email from the platform saying what so you're guess, trade has gone through. <laughs> I guess I can say that I have had no problems having an underling. Right. <laughs> well, the, so so there's two types it, of co-owners. It's like your, your team has an intern. Yes. Right, exactly. Sometimes I ask him for help when I think about it. Sometimes I do things and then get his validation later. Uh, and sometimes I forget to tell him at all. I think for a lot of people, they don't know. They've never heard of co-owners. They they had they don't have any in their league. Co-ownership is really really fun. Two people sharing, uh, you know, the responsibility for a team. But there's two different types of co-owners, right? In our league, in the league of record, most teams have a co-owner, and it's kind of a rite of passage to get your name on the list to be in the league. You know, every, everybody that is, you know, there's some, a long waiting list to be an owner, and that's. Like step one of being an eventual owner is you got to be a co-owner for some of the teams, be exposed to the league, get yourself primed up. So in this situation, I don't blame you, Andy, for being, um, you know, overlord, being overlord of your team because <laughs> I feel like my co-owner is a is a co-owner. Yes, uh, I am the owner of the franchise. You know what I mean? Like I'm, okay. I, 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 it's my team. <laughs> and I have a co-owner. Once again, not a co-owner's real definition, but yes, it's co-owner his, it's means the like co-owner's definition. Let me get like we all three of us are co-owners of the Fantasy Footballers podcast. Okay, yes, that's yes. the real definition. And so that of would be the other type of co <laughs> when two people go in on a team. Such a bad question. We have no comprehension of how to do this properly. My but way to do it properly. I feel is, like Jason because your co-owner is Brooks. Yeah, uh, Brooks. I've got uh, Michael Butler. I've got uh, you know a, a slew of co-owners. Yeah, okay. You have like a whole corporation, right? <laughs> oh, an ownership group, <laughs> right? I mean, like Jay Z owned a piece of the Nets once upon a time, but he wasn't the main guy. You know, is that fair? I guess I don't know. Do you, are you <laughs> charging for this? Are you? Oh is yeah, there a buy you guys let you guys let owners come for free? Not in my league. It's tough if if both are exact equal parts. You're going to have a difference of opinion each and every week on something. And the worst part of that is it's human nature to blame the person that got their way and then got it wrong. Okay, so that's the complication. Here's my solution for this because it, like I would generally say, well, who founded the team? Look, you get a slight edge when it comes to the vote of the start sit or the or the draft pick. But if you truly are a co-managed team, you both came in together and you have a disagreement, you have no choice but to go to the coin flip. The sure. NFL the NFL still uses coin flips to start games. They still use coin flips to split ties in draft yeah. picks. It's I'd rather you blame the coin than the fantasy footballers podcast <laughs> for a mistake. That's a good point. And that would uh, be impossible, Andy. Well, I have seen it su successfully managed. Like when two two owners maybe have different responsibilities. Somebody's responsible for like the waiver wire as their primary objective, and the other person might be more of a get the starting roster going, and somebody else might be more of the trade guy. Um, that that works, you know, or or just expand the league, and if you can't you get it, that. can't get it going, expand the league, add another add another team. Doesn't hurt nobody, and uh, we don't really have any. Big time news today. We thought we would. We thought we would have probably some significant fantasy football opt outs. Mm -hmm. The deadline for the NFL and NFLPA 
opt out uh, period was yesterday at four Eastern, and um, oof, nothing happened. I mean, Josh Doxson opted out. Sure. And so the real big offseason significant opt-out was Damian Williams. You had Devin Funches. You had a couple of wide receivers that were in the mix and, you know, like Marquise Goodwin types. But nothing really significant what? happened yesterday. There were 66 opt-outs in total across all positions, offensive and defense, in the NFL, which is 2.5% of the NFL player base. Yeah, and I was going to say that some of these opt-outs, I mean, the Damian Williams, that one's a major one. But the other ones do have, like, low-key – fantasy impact that you know it, it like line play you're saying like the o-lineman well yeah the lineman. offensive line but i'm speaking specifically to skill players where the devin funches opt out in green bay you didn't yes the aaron Rodgers wide receiver two hasn't been of value or for of fantasy value as they have been in past years but you know it's still a possibility and when devin funches getting the contract the free agent acquisition not a major one but still a free agent acquisition that the team wanted is okay. Well, will Devin Funches be that, or will it be Alan Lazard? To me, now it is clearly Alan Lazard. You don't think it's going to be Funches now that he's opted out? Exactly. That's. I mean, that's my point. And for for Miami, good, no, Miami's a good example too. Like yeah, Mike Gesicki is now now feels like a much safer breakout pick. I know there's you know Twitter has been uh, Mike Gesicki's faced some some Twitter backlash for not being elusive, not getting yards after the catch like George Kittle, but. His opportunity is now secure where he doesn't have to deal with uh, uh, fighting for slot reps with Albert Wilson. And he, Does you know, he get like, you're not elusive DMs on Twitter? Is that what happens? <laughs> no, that no, feels no. like it would hurt me if someone had sent that to so, me. Number one, uh, never ever tag a player for fantasy football. That's <laughs> like, This is a motto I live by, and I hope that our audience lives by it as well. They don't need to be brought into it. Uh, but like Albert Wilson could have been a problem for Gasicki to be a big slot tight end and Marquise Goodwin field stretcher for the Philadelphia Eagles him opting out I do believe forces Jalen Rager or th their hand to get Jalen Rager more involved than they were kind of talking about at the beginning of the offseason yeah I mean the, the Miami News I adjusted risk ratings associated with Devontae Parker and Mike Gesicki when you saw a little bit more clarity right. in the in the targets so and you're right Devin Ozzy Ozzy Oi, oi, rookie tight end for the Patriots. Might get some action. Because Matt Lacoste is gone. That is correct. Yeah. It's, anything's possible, Mike. That's what everything is everything. Uh, at the tight end position every single year, we you go in. You need to be careful though, because we we say we know what rookie tight ends do in general. Yes. I'm just saying you're you're like an eleven out of ten on Ozzy Ozzy hype right now. I'm just well, I'm look, just warning I love you for, the man's for you. name. I love the I, man's name. I give the man's name a a, a high score, uh, but not his fantasy production this year. I think I'd rather have Jeremy Sprinkle. No, you would not. No, another good name, right? Another and who? So whose name is better, mm, Jeremy Spr Sprinkle? Yeah. Well, I feel like you're going right to the the dessert. Well, name. of course. I mean, look at my body. <laughs> I I am a man of desserts. <laughs> I'm a man. I am of desserts. I am built by desserts. That's right. I am 60% dessert. If he was a thing, we'd have cupcake jokes. There's no doubt. Oh, yeah. Jeremy Sprinkle, get on it. Get, take care of business. <laughs> also, Folkland, do not draft either of these players. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Uh, do you have any other news that you want to bring up? Any other things to talk about? Are we? No, we're good. Let's get into the running backs. Um, all right. Let's do it. Running backs. Number one. This I, one will surprise yeah, everybody. Shocker. Uh, we we discussed this in internally here. We spent some time breaking things down, looking at it analytically, watching film. I was pretty upset that you guys copied my ranking here, to be honest. See, I thought you copied my ranking. Yeah, and I thought you guys copied my ranking. Mm. It is, of course, Eddie Lacy. That's right. No, Christian McCaffrey is the number one running back on our board. Not a surprise. Uh, we are going through our consensus top 10 running back rankings, half PPR, um, and and Christian McCaffrey's at the top of the list. He came out yesterday and said, look, I would draft myself first, becoming the first fantasy player to ever have that level of confidence mm -hmm. in himself. I, well, I like it. Oh, you got to love confidence. Yes. There are things that have been brought up on the show to, you know, you can't throw cold water on Christian McCaffrey. He 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 just rebukes it. It yes. doesn't land. But he is oil. 
<laughs> repels the water. He is oil. Um, you're right. You're yeah. right. And and McCaffrey will be in a position where we once again like you know different offensive system, different head coach, different quarterback. Those variables are in play. Also, you know, running backs, they fluctuate at the top of these lists, but McCaffrey's as guaranteed as anybody gets. He is the center piece of their offense, and he had, you know, when you look at wide receivers in the top 12, several wide receivers come from teams that were, you know, not successful on the field, high draft pick teams. Not as common at the running back position, and yet McCaffrey was one of those guys. I mean, he was number one in the league on a very bad team that struggled to get around the goal line, that struggled at the quarterback position. And so, you know, it's probably fair to say things are upgraded for Christian McCaffrey from a team perspective. And so anything that he would miss by way of a little bit of volume is probably safe. I mean, there's I just don't have a different expectation for him this year. No, I mean, the, the reason is because of his receiving work, right? He, yep. He is, I, I, I forget the stat, but at, if you just took his receiving work and put him in the wide receivers, he's basically one of the best wide receivers in fantasy football. You get that added to his rushing total. And so that's why, you know, if, if you're going to be a running back, you know, Derrick Henry is not going to succeed if the Titans are a bad team. But Christian McCaffrey can succeed when his team is bad because they dump the ball off. And the thing I really love is the fact that their offensive line is bad. Teddy Bridgewater is an accurate, not you know uh, pushing the ball down the field, but dumping it out, getting it out quick. Yeah, quick decisions. It's basically a perfect alignment for DJ Moore and Christian McCaffrey to have success this year. The fact that their defense is bad, they're completely trying to rebuild it. Their offensive line is bad. Their quarterback is a great short accurate passer it just all lines up there are you know if if at the end of the year Christian McCaffrey is the running back five because of all these changes nobody's going to be shocked but you have to put him number one based on what he's done in the past and while we uh, the fantasy footballers I don't know if you uh, I don't think we've announced this on the main show oh, but what are you doing you might want to check out our website and check out these new hot player profiles that we've got <laughs> coming soon but I've been doing some work behind the scene on the athletic profiles and when you just look at Christian McCaffrey and what he's able to do, not for fantasy, but just as a human being, you're like, oh, I see why he's so good at football. The uh, There's only been 18 wideouts in NFL history with 116 catches, and that's what Christian McCaffrey had last year. What? The 141 targets would have been eighth at the wide receiver position. Oh, my goodness. And then uh, let's just throw in 287 on the ground, 1,387 yards, and 15 touchdowns on a team that, that struggled at times on offense. He can break the big play. Percentage chance that CMC uh, repeats as the RB1, uh, that's a good question as we move towards the second player on our list. I, I put it at about 50%. Yeah, I'm right. I, I, I was thinking 45%, which that's would, very be, high. would be my largest percentage, You know, uh, even though it is under 50%. Yeah, I would say this is the most confident I've been in, a, in the RB1 repeating i'm still lower than you guys i would put it at about 35 maybe even 30 percent but follow the money got the bag who's behind him in the depth chart uh reggie super bonifon well the big the, the reason i have so much confidence in it compared to like maybe previous years is is the gap is not small between the saquon barkley and the ezekiel elliott reception totals of last year it's double. He has double the receptions of those two players last year, and obviously Saquon with the injuries and things like that. But I don't have some tremendous amount of confidence that New York's going to, you know, up that total tremendously. So that's why that percentage is higher than maybe previous years. And and throwing this out there, last thing I think we should say on Chris McCaffrey: the depth chart is part of the confidence in him. There's really nobody to, you know, you you brought up Reggie Bonifant as as the backup, but it is also worth noting because people sometimes are are drafting the backup um that it could be mike davis and i right. would i would in fact i i just did a, a a best ball league where i did draft mike davis not reggie bonifon all right number two on our consensus rankings number two for me number two for jason number three for mike ezekiel elliott of the dallas cowboys he's as uh reliable a fantasy option at running back as you can really get Average 19.2 fantasy points per game and 24 touches per game through uh, his 56 NFL games. Coming into the year, 
lost his center, Travis Frederick. He retired. Kind of didn't have him for all of last year. Kellen Moore is still the offensive coordinator. It's an offense that can move the football. Great deal of confidence in Dak Prescott and what they were able to do last year. When I look at Zeke, I guess the the only thing that comes to mind from a negative perspective is I don't think Zeke's going to finish a lot of blowouts. I think Tony Pollard's going to get some playing time in those situations. You'll probably be looking, you know, you have the great Zeke game first three quarters and you're saying, man, this could become one of those monster games. Might not be on the field a lot to end them just because I think they like Tony Pollard. I think they want to give him some opportunities to to do things here and there, but it really doesn't affect, obviously, my ranking on Zeke. He's number two. Yeah, I mean, what it does is it says that instead of being the running back one that week, he's going to be the running back six on a weekly basis. And so it takes a little bit of the the edge off. But on the flip side, uh, not on the upside, but on the downside, he is the safest. A lot of sides. A lot of sides. Well, it's, you know, we're all this coin talk. There's at least two sides to every coin. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Um. He he is the, by far the safest running back to me. He is his his offense is intact. His offensive coordinator is the same, even though the the head coach has changed. He has been the most consistent running back since he entered the league. The fewest number of bus games last season. Literally not one bus game. Nobody, not even Christian McCaffrey, could say that. Um, and you do have this extra wrinkle of the fact that we know he has. Uh, gone through co- the the coronavirus, uh, and you you we don't know, man. We know no, this he went is through an it. absolutely that, that worthy point to bring up. That one we know, know he went through it because he said it, and yeah, it, he, it, he, did. It, he was upset that his agent said that. But we know that one. Um, and my point is, so I I was just the number two draft pick um, in a, in an expert best ball league, a full PPR, and I had the choice between Saquon and uh, and Zeke. And that was the tiebreaker for me. So, I mean, if it, if it matters to me, I think it would matter to others in the sense that it's just one. I mean, look, I love both those guys. You could, I don't know, flip a coin between them. Uh, but that was my tiebreaker. And I think it's, I, I just can't imagine anyone safer than Zeke. I can't, he, he doesn't get injured. He can carry the workload. He's got a great offensive line, a great offense, continuity, and he's always been great. That's why he, I think some people would be surprised that he's our number two and not Saquon. Yeah, and speaking of the the player that I have at number two, we're going to get into that. But first, want to thank today's sponsor, Fantasy Champs. This is the place you need to go for your fantasy hardware. You want to show off the the victory? Grab a trophy, grab a ring, grab a belt. Just grab something from FantasyChamps.com so you can rub it in everybody else's face that you were the winner and they were not. In fact, they were all losers. So remind them of that of that on a daily basis. And right now, they're running a promo that if you buy a trophy or a belt and you use the code BALLERDRAFT, they're going to give you a free draft kit uh, if you're doing something, you know, where you like to, you're a little bit of an analog person, you know, not digital, analog. You want to put it up on the board. You can get a free one using the code BALLERDRAFT, save 39 bucks if you buy a trophy or a belt. That's fantasychamps.com. All right, Mike, did you want to add anything to the Zeke or we, we move on? I, it, it's just a transition of the reason I have Zeke at number three is because I have Saquon Barkley at number two. And the reason for that is I'm going with burst. I'm going with uh, huge games instead of the consistency. I I will not argue. I think that Zeke is a safer pick. He's going to be a top 24 running back each and every week. But those ceiling games... Barkley is going to have more of them he, that will push you in fully into victories. Like like week 16, if you mm. were in your championship week and you had Saquon Barkley, mm. you could have benched everybody else on the team and he would have handled the business by himself. It's, it's hard for me to see those games coming at any sort of regular clip for Zeke. I mean, it, it was nice to have the, uh, the touchdown positive regression come back. Where you you know he was over fourteen hundred yards two years ago and only hit six touchdowns. It bounced back the way that it should, but because of the the high ceiling games that that can come from Saquon Barkley, which I mean he was hitting ceilings all the time until the injury and the recovery time of the injury. That's why I have Saquon number three. Week seven on or, was, uh, number two. Sorry. Yeah, week seven on he was the RB five. I got no problem with that, Mike. I think in a uh, full PPR, I think Saquon has you know. Like you said, breakaway potential on mm-hmm. any given play. That's what he's shown uh, outside of the injury window. 
Picks up Jason Garrett as an offensive coordinator. Which I, I don't mind at all. It's I mean, fine to me. You, you have Jason Garrett coming from the Cowboys where he used Ezekiel Elliott as a workhorse, so no fears of him trying to put some committee in place when you've got Saquon. Mike, big news for you, I know. Uh, from the 4th of August, this came out, according to Empire Sports Media, Saquon Barkley's thighs actually look like they have gotten bigger. That's impossible. Yes. Oh, no. Can he still walk? Can the Grand Canyon become more grand? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Goodness gracious, that's impossible. Can he still walk? Like how does how does this man put, put pants on? Those are custom. Those are <laughs> that's a custom pant right there. The zip mean, ups. Like, do you remember the the old like like general pants where it was like really really skinny on the bottom, but then they just they oh get, yeah. They get what did you used to wear? Wide? What did you used to wear in J high school? Oh, Jinkos. Jinkos could fit those. Oh, yeah, it's true. Maybe they'd Saquon, be a little tight. But look, say. <laughs> <laughs> Those, so these are my someone, skinny jeans. Someone introduced Saquon to Jinkos. His skinny jeans are Jinkos? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Give me my skinny jeans, honey. Here's your Jinkos. We're going out tonight. We're going out. <laughs> He's great. I agree with uh, Mike that he, he his upside on a weekly basis, he will give you higher explosive games. His athletic profile is off the charts. What he's done his entire career has been great until he got injured last year and it had a little bit slower time getting back from the, the high ankle sprain. Uh, but obviously at the end of the year, you saw it. I'm 100% fine uh, with any one of these three guys taking him number one. Now, I would have no problem. We did see the targets go down for... Barkley when they made the switch to Daniel Jones but again that's it was a small sample that you can't say for certainty that's what's going to happen next year he's still going to get a bunch of targets all right Dalvin Cook at number four we weren't positive he would end up here by this time but he is but he's back he's back and uh, I've got him at four Mike has him at four Jason at five he was absolutely dominant uh, to begin the year he was the RB2 from weeks one through 14 and my guess, if I were to presume upon my colleagues here, would be that the reason he doesn't fit in that top three tier is the injury risk. We saw it at the very end of the yeah, year. Yeah, that's and, correct. And so you know that you have a window here. It wasn't one week, two week, three week. You have a 14-week uh, a window where he was the RB2 in that span, but he didn't help you in the fantasy playoffs. He has a history of uh, not being able to finish seasons, and so that knocks him down a little bit. It raises that risk rating up. But at the same time, if you're comfortable with that risk, he is the player that, you know, we get the question of where do you want to draft? Like if you could pick your own draft spot, are you comfortable going down into the four, five, six range? If you look at Dalvin Cook in the same lens as a Saquon or as a Zeke, then, you know, that gives you the opportunity to draft higher in the second round. I think that this offense is built. I mean, we've seen it around Dalvin Cook. This is also a, a team that I have a little bit more confidence in the stability of than somebody like the New York Giants um, or even Christian McCaffrey at the top. So, you know, you just have to take that injury risk if that's if you're going to go Dalvin Cook. Yeah, I, I would be curious if he didn't get injured at the end of the season, played through the playoffs, and was just completely healthy. Because like you said, Great the question. entirety of the season, he was the running back too. Uh, he, he averaged 20 points a game and half PPR. That was... Uh, you know, you, you think about Austin Eckler was great. He was number five. He was down at 17 points per game. So he was dominant. And if he had stayed healthy, would he be, you know, up in that conversation with the other three guys we mentioned? 100%. I think he would. Yeah. But I mean, the reality is he has an injury that has a degree of needing uh, surgery in the future. Like there, there's a, a percentage that is higher than 10% that he will need surgery in the future. And that is enough for me to worry about him. He's not my number four, um, you know, So, but the workload, if he plays 16, I think everyone would say he's going to be one of those rare elite backs that give you double production in, in one. Third role. most goal line carries last year, despite missing two games. That's hot. Second in fantasy points per game. Fourth in evaded tackles and an offense entirely Zimmerfied. He wants <laughs> that, to yeah. run that football. And you get Gary Kubiak. You get Koobs. Koobs is leading the charge. Uh, he is now the offensive coordinator. Koobs is, uh, you know how we talk about Kyle Shanahan mm -hmm. and about how his team has always been able to get the running game going the way that nobody 
else has. Well, not the way nobody else has. He got it. He got it from his daddy, and his daddy worked with Kubiak, and their system is unbelievable. That was part of what made Dalvin Cook last year, but now Kubiak is totally in charge. So if you want to take a shot at health, and you take him number four, I don't have any problem with it. But I, you know, we've talked about this before. My draft strategy in the first round is that everyone is great. Everyone has the chance to be top five at their position. So I avoid risk. I avoid things that are seeable coming. You know what I mean? Sure. Like I, we, if if he gets injured, we're gonna go. Ah, dang it! I knew it. But that's not enough for you. I mean, I, I understand the risk aversion, but is that enough for you to go select a Michael Thomas over a Dalvin Cook? Yeah. Because, so you would. Wow. If, if you're okay. sitting there, you would. I would not. <laughs> but my hmm, answer to the question yeah, is I would not. that is enough to make that decision. If you are looking at, you know, and, and if I was in a three wide receiver PPR, I would take Michael Thomas over Dalvin Cook. So you have uh, Alvin Kamara ranked higher than Dalvin I, Cook? I do, yes. Okay, so you have Alvin, you're have you taking Alvin Kamara at pick four? Correct. And then, so pick five, you would you would at least consider going Michael Thomas over Dalvin Cook? If it was a three wide receiver full okay. PPR, yeah. If right. it's if and it's then well, we'll talk about Alvin Kamara shortly. Yeah, yeah. But it, I mean, he has similar injury concerns. And then the, uh, the final thing, so the because Jason and I have both been pretty vocal about if I'm willing to take the risk on Dalvin Cook, I am drafting the insurance running back, the backup running back Alexander Madison, who has. If you looked at the ADP, you know, early in the off season with all the the uh, hullabaloo about a possible holdout, Madison was jumped up to you know seventh, even the sixth round. He has since plummeted. Jason, where are you targeting that you draft Cook? Now you're going to target Madison. I think you'll get, you're going to make sure you get him. So which round are you? Willing I think to you'll go? get him every ninth round. Uh, okay, I, I think he'll be there because the holdout is over. You no, know, nobody who doesn't have Cook is going to draft Alexander Madison. Not nobody, but the vast majority of leagues, uh, you'll he'll be there for early. you in the ninth round. Yeah. And if I take Cook, I am my ninth round pick is auto locked in. Uh, and if I'm super late in the, in the ninth, then maybe, maybe you eighth. consider it in the eighth. All right, let's move on to number five on our consensus list. And we start to get some more diversion between us at this point. Uh, but it is, amazingly, Clyde Edwards, Alaire, mm. the Kansas City Chiefs. We talked about Damian Williams' opt-out, the hype around Clyde, first-round draft pick, hand-selected by Patrick Mahomes. and And I have met seven jason at six mike at five uh and he ends up five in our consensus rankings because of some differences of opinion on on the players after uh in in my rankings so um 10 touchdowns is that a safe projection for clyde edwards alaire yes to me that is safe you you're talking about the the number one scoring offense or at least whatever top three if, if kansas city has a bad year they're Third. Third. <laughs> yeah. So you're talking about a huge opportunity for touchdowns. The the fact that he was a first round running back, I get it. You know, maybe you're nervous about drafting a rookie running back in the first round, but he was drafted in the first round, and we see time and time again these players get opportunity immediately. There was a little bit of concern with Damian Williams being the presumed starter. But now that he has opted out for his family, Clyde Edwards is is the unquestioned starter of this team. He's going to get first round draft capital opportunity on a very high scoring offense and on an offense that the running back doesn't just score rushing touchdowns. Like we we saw, you know, Kareem Hunt and Damian Williams both having major success of scoring reception or receiving touchdowns, which not all Running backs have that in their repertoire. Uh, but, but all the Chiefs running backs do. And that's absolutely. the kind of interesting point with Clyde edwards alaire is the other two significant uh, players in the backfield were drafted to be the same thing it w or, or picked up as well. DeAndre sure. Washington at Texas Tech with Patrick mm -hmm. Mahomes, another guy he had an influence in bringing in, can catch the ball. Darwin Thompson, he can catch the football. Started to progress a little bit in that respect towards the end of the year. Um, so you may see, I mean, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. I think Clyde gets the majority work, um, but I think those two guys will be worked in as well. Yeah, to to me, this is the opportunity to 
uh, have uh, Edwards Alaire come in in game one be the guy. I, I That's how I, I see it happening. Now, that's not to say that the other players won't be utilized, but I think they want him involved, getting the experience in his rookie season. And it's kind of, you know, Damian Williams forced the issue. And if he yes. is involved in, you know, being more of a workhorse, more of a old school LaShawn McCoy uh, role that Andy Reid had, not last year's LaShawn McCoy sure. that Andy Reid had. I, oh, who still had success on the field. Yeah, I mean, I just can't fathom, you know, with the lanes. I talked a lot of trash talk about Damian Williams. I did not think he was a great running back. I thought he was an average running back. He's fast, but he's not something special. And I believe you would point to the Le LaShawn McCoy stats last year as evidence of Damian Williams being in a good situation, productive, but not. I would, yeah, and I would point even more to the Damian Williams stats. In the sense that <laughs> it's a good thing to point to. He was great for fantasy, but I don't think he was a great running back. Clyde Edwards Alaire is more talented um, than either of those guys, D Lashawn at last year or Damian Williams yep. now. And so when he gets the full opportunity, he will be outstanding. I mean, you know, this. What is the ceiling for Clyde Edwards Alaire before we move on to the number six on our rankings? What is the actual possibility? Where could he finish? I think the ceiling is number three. I don't think he's going to get the workload to be the number one. Uh, but it's, it's I mean, as high as it gets. Ceiling is top three for me. All right. Let's go to number six on our list. Ho, ho, ho. Alvin Kamara. Mm. Star power was not what it usually is for him last year. I think he, he would have ended up on our consensus ranks ahead of Clyde edwards if it wasn't for me. I've met eight. Jason has him at four. Mike at six. Last year, just five touchdowns on the ground in 14 games. Dealt with injuries. Um, dealt with coming back from injury, 81 receptions, which is his uh, required total <laughs> for three yes. consecutive years on 97 targets. I, The reason I have Alvin Kamara lower than, you know, in a different tier than some of the other running backs is simple. It is the same exact reason, although inverse in play style, as why Nick Chubb has a bump down comparatively to these guys. You have two competent, not just a backup situation, running backs, in the fold, um, Alvin Kamara is going to catch 80-plus passes. I do not think it is a guarantee that he positively regresses with the touchdown totals on the ground. Latavius Murray will be used, just like Kareem Hunt will be used in Cleveland, and that takes a little bit of the upside away from these players. When you combine that with an injury history where he gets a little bit banged up, he's been concussed, you've dealt with that each and every year with Alvin Kamara, not in some great degree where it submarines your whole season, but where, you know, last year was tough. You you saw him come back from injury, and all of a sudden Alvin Kamara was giving you uh Yeah, that would be his fantasy finish, not fantasy points. Oh, no. In week 14. Mm. And, uh, you know, Latavius Murray was a compliment to this offense. This team was great last year. He is a piece of it. So it just takes a little bit of the upside away from Alvin Kamara for me. Clearly not for Jason with him at four ahead of Clyde Edwards-Alaire, so I'll I'll hand you the baton. Yeah, I I mean, yes, he had a week uh, where he was 55. That was his one week, uh, interesting to point that out, where he was <laughs> bad after the uh, after he got back from injury. But the other games, you know, 15th, 7th, 8th, 23rd, 5th, 12th, he was always 29th. A, 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 a valuable back, and that was while he wasn't <laughs> scoring touchdowns. That was while he wasn't he scoring. He just read everyone off except for the 29th. Uh, uh, that was while he wasn't scoring touchdowns. The continuity for the Saints is incredible. I don't know that there is a team in the league, I mean, that has as much continuity. Same head coach, same uh, quarterback, same system, same the offensive time. line in intact. And this is a guy who's been great forever um, since he came into the league. And we, you know, you might worry, oh, the injury. He's missed three games in three years. You know, he's drafted at the same time as Dalvin Cook, who's missed 19 games in three years. Uh, Kamara is, you know, there is no guarantee that the that the touchdowns regress to the mean, but the statistical probability says it does. And, you know, he's always been great at, at, at scoring touchdowns. So I do expect his touchdowns to go up. He is healthy. There's no injury report to read on him, unlike Dalvin Cook's shoulder injury, which has, you know, a, a frequency of needing another surgery. Dalvin Cook had a high ankle sprain. Once that is fully healed, that's just a thing of the past. So I like 
the offense. I like the continuity. I like what we've seen his entire career. I would be happy to take him number four. It, going into this offseason, I wasn't sure because we, we had a bad taste in our mouth, right? The Once he got back from injury, he was the running back eight, which is good, right. but it wasn't like, you know, we're talking about him at the Camario. beginning of the first round. Do you want running back eight there? No, you want someone who's top three, but I, I believe that one, he was struggling coming back from that injury. Same that you know happened to Saquon, and the touchdowns just ha didn't happen to go his way. I don't think that's going to stay that way for Kamara. And for me, it's I'm not worried about Latavius Murray. Like Alvin Kamara had all of his success earlier with Mark Ingram also having success for that team. And Latavius Murray, I mean, aside from the 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 two games you know in the middle of the season where Kamara was out. He's only Murray was seeing maybe an average of ten opportunities per game. Kamara is still the main guy. You saw his five zone carries drop from thirteen down to eight uh, from so two years ago thirteen last year only eight. I I I'm still good drafting well, that, Kamara as, as a top. Yeah, I mean you can you can kind of make the argument however you want. I mean Latavius Murray has played on the team for one year. And even though he's had success with Ingram, the team may use Murray in a different fashion. They, yeah, those five zone carries are more of a reflection of uh, a confidence in Latavius Murray. And well, that's, Murray only I mean, had I've four. Got him, I've got him buried at eight, <laughs> so I can see why why you guys. Well, we have like this that. is what we have we have to fight about this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Number fight, seven, fight, fight. fight, fight. This, is, this is our big differences <laughs> on this show. So Derrick Henry comes in at number seven on our consensus top ten running back rankings. Last year, 303 carries, 1,540 yards, 16 touchdowns on the ground. Didn't do any damage through the air, 18 for 206 and 2. But uh, he is just such a volume hog and an efficiency hog, and this is an offense that is built entirely around him. Now he's been paid, and um, you know he's a beast of a man. He led the league in yards after contact. He uh, led the league in 102 yards a game. You're going to get... 100 yards a game from Derrick Henry this year. The The only question in anyone's mind is, do you get 16 touchdowns again? And that's what you need. You need a ton of touchdowns, not 16. You know, if he comes through with 13, he's going to be great. But you do need the touchdowns because the— 12, 12 the year before in 2018, 16 last year. Right. And and I I presume, and I have statted him out to get— uh, he he is my league leading t you know rushing touchdown in projections right now. Um, he last year had seven games where he was a top five running back, uh, and that's including the fact that you know the first six weeks of the season he had Marcus Mariota. The team wasn't that good. the The ceiling for Derrick Henry, I I do think even without the passing game, could be that running back one. You know if if, mm. if he gets twenty touchdowns, there's not there's not a lot of there, you know how many backs out there could you, without laughing, say, yeah, he could get twenty touchdowns, touchdowns this touchdowns. year. It reminds me so much of Marshawn Lynch when Seattle ran the ball the way they did with with Marshawn, where the games were ended with Marshawn Lynch. That was the whole. Lynch will give you the two or three touchdown games because the third and fourth quarter were just hand the ball to him, and it still worked. You still picked up first downs. You still picked up big plays. Henry's shown the ability to have breakaways, but there is unquestionably more risk to him because you do not have the kind of risk dis you know break broken up between okay he didn't run well this game but he got the passing yardage um if the game scripts start to flip if the titans aren't as good of a team is if, if Tannehill is not as good exactly then, then that will be a problem because jason what you were talking about when mariota was in uh henry was getting 70 rushing yards a game still very solid but that number jumped up to 125 rushing yards per game when Tannehill was in there and I mean, Tannehill was absolutely dominant for for Tennessee. So that that's the that's the question: is that his success does ride a little bit more on other players uh, of of his team than than these other running backs that we're talking about? And then in you know the offensive line, they did lose Jack Conklin on the right. Like so, that there is there is some concern, but I'm not betting against Derrick Henry. All right, Josh Jacobs comes in at number eight. He is number six on my rankings, 11 for Jason, nine for Mike. Josh Jacobs is a flag plant for me this year. Yes. I believe he makes the jump into the upper tier of, of fantasy running back. I believe he sees an increase in passing work, and he showed us in spans last year um, what he was capable of doing, and more importantly for fantasy, 
the willingness of the head coach to give him sufficient opportunities to be in the upper tier of fantasy running backs. Now, are you reading it at all into the uh, the hype train piece that Coach Gruden was uh, allegedly upset that Kyler Murray took home Rookie of the Year and Josh Jacobs didn't? Which because Jacobs easily could have uh, have taken home Rookie of the Year. I was worried. You right, know, when, yeah. when, as when, a Kyler fan? As yeah. a Kyler fan, I was like, I don't know if Kyler gets this because of Jacob. Now, I don't think it, people understand how good he was. Go ahead, Mike. I just say that there, there's, there's whispers in the bushes that Gruden was very upset about it and that he is going to use this year to set out to prove that Jacob's should have been that guy. Well, to answer your question of – I mean, stroll along narrative street Have I us. considered that? No, because I did not know that. So <laughs> oh, well, now you know. That's not part of my consideration. But what is is uh, he had a, an incredible rookie season that is – kind of forgotten about because he missed weeks 14, 16, 17, played with injuries in week weeks 12 and 13, yet still finished the rookie year with over 1,100 rushing yards, seven rushing touchdowns, and just you know wasn't heavily involved on third down, running a lot of routes in the offense, had a six-game or a five-game span in the middle of the season where he was on pace for 1,600-plus yards, has shown, you know, and 400 opportunities. If that's the way that John Gruden is willing to use him for a span last year, you know, maybe that gets a little bit um, more regular in 2020. Dalvin Cook made the jump last year. I think Jacobs makes it this year, and uh, they involve him in in the passing game a little bit more. His number one attribute coming out of college. So he's a great pass catcher, and that's the that's the question, right? Is he going to get more involved in the passing game? It was infuriating last year watching him dominate. NFL defenders just make them look silly, run through them, run around them, and never really be involved in the passing game. And unlike Todd Gurley, who was running routes and was a ama- you know just not getting the ball thrown to him, not getting open or, or or whatnot, he wasn't involved in the passing game. Now, hopefully, that's because he was a rookie. They used him as a first and second down running back and didn't want him to have to uh, you know shoulder that kind of knowledge and responsibility and pass block and all this stuff as much his shoulder was hurt so that was harder there you go um, hard to shoulder when you got a bad shoulder yeah. so but it's common this has happened before where extremely good rookie running backs who were explosive on the ground had more than 1100 yards rushing and fewer than 30 targets, you see them take that jump next year almost across the board. I'll give you a few examples. You had uh, Cadillac Williams, who ran for 1,178 yards, only 25 targets in his rookie year, went up to 44. You had Marshawn Lynch, 1,115 yards, only 26 targets, went up to 67 targets the next year. Todd Gurley, you forget rookie year, 1,100 yards, only 26 targets, went up to 58 targets. Sometimes these great running backs aren't utilized in the passing game their rookie year, and the coach goes, well, they're really great, so I should I should involve them. There were some miscalculations last year. Gruden does have the old school, when I get around the goal line, it goes to my running back mentality, which whether you bemoan it as a fantasy or as a NFL fan, he just does that. And so that I think that gives him a, a, a rushing touchdown ceiling as well. Miles Sanders at number nine. I got him at 13, Jason at seven, Mike at 10. To be honest, that feels ridiculous to me that I am somehow the lowest on Miles Sanders. It is a little bit strange. The drumbeat of the past two years and my confidence that Peterson would eventually submit to a workhorse. But that's where the projections go. And that's what we do here on the show is we project stat lines. And if they line up a certain way, that's how they line up. Jason, you have him at seven. You've talked a lot about him recently. We probably don't have to spend forever on Miles Sanders, but go to the Fire and Ice episode, and you'll you'll hear my fire earlier There's this Monday's week. show. That was, that was Monday. Monday's yeah. show. Just go back, and you can hear me talk. It's up. enough fire to last through the week. I'll tell you that absolutely, and it's a great episode anyway. So i I won't say much other than to say I truly believe that there is no chance he is not a a workhorse back. He will be one of the few workhorse. Now, how good he is with that, with this offense, that's TBD. So, and yeah, you've got him at thir- 50 receptions. I mean, that's you've that's got great. him at running back 13. That's ve- he could be a workhorse back and finishes the running back 13. That's yeah, David Montgomery. That's very, uh, you know, in, in the realm of outcome. But I am confident that he is a workhorse back this year. He will get the majority of the carries and enough targets, be on the field a lot. So, I like him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I you've made the case. I I don't 
you have any objections to the fact that this is his backfield at this point in time. Last year, 179 carries, 50 receptions. Um, if he's given the opportunity so far in his young career, he's proven he can do it. I do like this team note here um, from it maybe Brooks, maybe Kyle. It just says J. Howe is gone. I has has he ever been Jay called Howe? J. Howe? That was me. Jordan Howard. That's J, he's J. Howe. J. Howe. J. Howe has Jay not been Howe. able to stay on one Let's team. Spice him up a little bit. J. Yeah. Howdy. Howdy. <laughs> J. Howdy. Gross. <laughs> All right. I'm uh, sorry, Jordan. I'm gonna I'm gonna hand the baton to Mike here as we wrap up our uh, top ten running backs. But Aaron Jones comes in at number ten. Uh, not disrespected after that monster finish last year, and uh, definitely more up and down than other running backs. Had some disappearing yes. weeks. That just how the game flow went. In fact, he had five weeks, I believe, or four weeks that were um, not what you expected out of a running back that ended what number two in uh, fantasy. I believe that's correct. Two or three, I think it might sixteen touchdowns. Format. Yeah, sixteen touchdowns that did not come in the same fashion that uh, Derrick Henry's touchdowns came in. But four hundred and seventy-four yards through the air, three touchdowns. Aaron Jones, why, why do we have trouble not just awarding him that top spot again? Uh, I would. You tell me, because I, I I still have him as a top ten guy. Yeah, I mean, I've got him as an RB one, but he is my last RB one at at running back twelve and a half point scoring. Uh, the reasons are I don't trust Matt Lafleur, and I do think AJ Dillon is going to eat some of these touchdowns away. Now the touchdown regression was already you mean AJ coming. Villain? AJ Villain, that's right. I wonder, oh no! Oh, he's gonna I vulture was these you touchdowns. Up. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank takes you, a little longer to find new drops, Mike. Yeah, that's uh, fine. You know the the reality is uh, he was he was he's not going to repeat you know nineteen touchdowns um, next year, and that was without AJ Dillon. If 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 he was down at ten, that's still a great number. Now if if AJ Villain takes two of those and you're at eight, it, it just pushes you back a little bit. I expect him to be more involved in the passing game this year um, because I think AJ Dillon will eat into Jamal Williams role a little bit more and Jamal Williams is much more of a pass catcher than AJ Villain so he'll make up some ground in the pass catching work he is electric he's very Alvin Kamara-esque as far mm -hmm. as talent on the field if he was playing for the Saints he would be my running back four yeah that's a that's a really good point yeah I mean with a little bit more clarity in the backfield a little less dependency on the super high touchdown totals um I think it's a fair summary a little better Mike, offensive Mike line. yeah you're you're a big Aaron Jones fan yeah, I, I like Aaron Jones. I think he's a spectacular talent. I like the fact that I will have a running back that can hit a home run. It, you know, on just he can take a, a fifty-yard reception to the house, fifty-yard carry to the house. Uh, you you saw him; his targets share uh, went from six percent up to twelve percent. And if he's even more involved, Jay, as you're projecting, it's what we asked for it is uh, right? yeah. like fa rarely fantasy owner or you know fantasy football players in the offseason when we ask for things do they come true and this was one where it was like yeah we are going to use them more and he did have a lot of touchdowns uh so perhaps the the opportunities drop you know he had 13 carries inside the five those 13 carries turned it eight into eight touchdowns wow. wow which i mean it it sounds pretty egregious but you know like Dalvin Cook, very close uh, in percentage of, of carries inside the five, turning into touchdown. Zeke, much higher. Henry, much higher. So the actual success inside the five what well, is not outlandish. Perhaps it's the 13 carries that do come down, like we saw with uh, Kamara, where he dropped from 13 down to eight, I think is what I just said. But the 10th most touches at the running back position. I still think Aaron Jones is the main guy. I like A.J. Dillon. He's a, if you're not familiar who A.J. Dillon is, he comps very similarly uh, size, build, athleticism to, Superman. to Derrick Henry. So, look, I'm, I am not calling him Derrick Henry by any means, but you shouldn't be shocked if he turns out to be a, a Derrick Henry type player. But for now, Aaron Jones is the guy. I still believe that the Packers uh, will be a, a solid team. He's one of the easiest to doubt, Solid but that could cost you. I mean, yes, it, he's, you know when you find an argument, we're talking top ten running backs. So he is, he does carry risk, he, higher risk than he is a lot of players. He has fallen in a draft to where I he he's easy to grab the the, the second round. 
the aforementioned league where I was the number two pick and I took Ezekiel Elliott, I was able to grab Aaron Jones that is oh, wow. perfect. at the wow. end of the second round. I mean, so like, there's that's such, outstanding. There's such polar opposites of Aaron Jones being inconsistent but high ceiling games. That would be that would be an incredible that's, start. That's probably the best combo you could yeah. imagine ending up with. Yes. because You did it, Jason. Oh, Congratulations. That's right. I did it. <laughs> Christian McCaffrey, Ezekiel Elliott, Saquon Barkley, Dalvin Cook, Clyde Edwards-Alaire, Alvin Kamara, Derek Henry, Josh Jacobs, Miles Sanders, and Aaron Jones. And we will have another Running Backs Rankings show on Monday. Best Ball Breakdown, presented by Underdog Fantasy. Super. <laughs> yeah, it is time for our first Underdog Fantasy Best Ball Breakdown segment. As we head into 2020, we're going to be bringing you a weekly strategy segment for best ball players. Because Best ball is it, back. It's very fun to you. It's all about the draft, which is what the off season and mock drafting, all that stuff is. And this, you know, just adds that element of look. You might win some money. You can play on Underdog Fantasy. You can sign up today, enter their Best Ball Mania for a chance at one million in prizes. You just go to UnderdogFantasy.com or search for Underdog Fantasy app in the App Store. Jason will be bringing us the tip the, of the week. Except, hold up, wait a minute. Well. Is a chopper? I'm going to go with two today. Oh, and two before, tips. Before you do, Jake, get into the tips, just want to elaborate a little bit more for Underdog. People have asked us, draft is gone. I used to play all my best ball on draft. I'm sad. Where do I, what do I do? If you play it on draft, you will like Underdog Fantasy. Trust me. The app is amazing. I mean, it really, like, the it, it really is great. Um, it's the best place to play, uh, and, and that's, that's a genuine, heartfelt, truth from yes. from me so here is my uh first of all tip number one do these it makes you better at fantasy it lets you see where people are taking people in real life you're not drafting a mock draft against a computer that's just drafting based on adp that's drafting based on a circular logic of computers drafting that same adp this is real people taking the players where they will in a real draft um so my first tip here and this is very different we don't usually maybe with the COVID year, we don't usually draft backup running backs in draft season in your home leagues and your redraft leagues. You're just going to hold on to them for a couple of weeks, need a roster spot, end up dropping them and then picking them up later off of waivers when, and if the starter goes down, but in best ball, you've got a very deep league and very often these, these insurance options for great teams are, Best ball league winners. All of a sudden, your you know twentieth round pick can, or your tenth round pick can, all of a sudden become your highest scoring player on a week. But here is what you don't want to do: you draft Zeke, don't draft Tony Pollard, don't do it. Here's why: in best ball, you have to you have to win. There's no playoffs. You're not trying to be in the top half or the, the you have to win the league one of the six best teams you're you're trying to win the league if Zeke goes down yes Pollard gets better but your team overall does not get better got worse yeah so yay you finished fourth out of 12 <laughs> you did you did your best you, you you survived you treaded the water good job great good job champ <laughs> um what you want to do is oh. if you draft Zeke or if you draft whoever you draft Grab other people's insurance policies, other people's backup running backs. If you've got Zeke and Saquon, grab Alexander Madison and Chase Edwards. Then all of a sudden when – Edmonds. Uh, what did I say? Edwards? You did. Chase Edmonds. Um, then if those, you almost You almost convinced me it was Edwards. Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, then if those – starters go down your team just gets better and it becomes elite so don't draft your own team's backup running backs do draft other teams backup running backs and here's the other tip the secret tip if you're playing on underdog you could play like you know three man leagues they're not all 12 man uh rosters if you're in a three man league the elite here's the players that really matter a lot. Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, those guys matter. Everyone's going to be stacked at running back and wide receiver. 
And sometimes you'll find yourself in a three person league where, um, the other people are just constantly loading up on these running backs and wide receivers and letting you snag these quarterbacks that they're like, Oh, I'm late round quarterback. Well, yeah, but you, there's so few, there's only there's three, three teams. teams. So the difference between the truly elite at the position make a difference. I'll give you an example. I just did a, a, a draft where I was the first pick, got Christian McCaffrey. I have Dalvin Cook and Clyde Edwards Alaire. You know, the, the running backs are good. Wow, you drafted pretty well. <clears throat> yeah. Well, here's the thing. I also have Lamar Jackson and Patrick did Mahomes. Did he get Chase Edwards? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, no, I not can't a find him in the system. <laughs> but, you know, after a couple picks, they weren't. I was shocked to see them there. So I just hit Pat Mahomes and Lamar Jackson, and then the next round got uh, Travis Kelsey and Zach Ertz. You're, those players at those positions, yes. the other two teams can't compete with me at those positions now. Thank you, Jason. You're welcome. That was very um, energetic as well. Underdogfantasy.com if you want to play some best ball. By the way, do you know who Chase Edwards is friends with? Darnell Anderson. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That'll do it for this episode of the oh Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Do us a favor. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps the show a lot. We'll talk to you on Monday. See you next week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.